at the core of Christianity is the resurrected Christ. And we can only learn about Christ through this book. And don't think that you begin to learn about Christ through strictly the New Testament. Your journey begins in learning about God and God's plan for man through the Old Testament. You navigate your way through that. You get to the New Testament, you realize that God had a plan. Man flubbed it up, but God had a plan. And this unfolding of the what we'll call the drama of human redemption, as it unfolds on these pages throughout the 66 books that have been canonized for us, um, are what we use as our reference guide. I am not going to talk about trying to determine or ascertain today the reliability or the validity of this book. So today we're going to act on a principle that we will eventually, I have to get to for those people who are still asking the questions, how can I trust this book? Is this book reliable? Is it true? I'm not addressing that today. I'm going to act as though I've covered the subject. Forgive me if that sounds um, a little flippant. But I will eventually get to that subject, whether it be here or on the Festival of Faith, so I don't want to waste the time trying to explain that today. The only thing I will tell you, and I mentioned this last week and I'll repeat it, there are more ancient witnesses. I'm talking about documents extant that is complete or fragments that are witnesses to this book, specifically the New Testament books themselves, then there are of most ancient literature, including that of Roman, of Greek, and even of Judaism. So we've got a real abundant source that dates back, far back. And if you're interested in that type of history and stuff, which is fascinating to me, and I love that, uh, as I said, I'd like to be able to make a presentation. I think I actually may bring some fragments. Some of you who saw the fragments put on display, it's, kind of mind-boggling, but when you see the fragments in person, it really does change the, your perspective to understand you may be looking at a fragment that is maybe, albeit maybe, 100 to maybe at most 200 years removed from the time of Christ, and that begins to put things in perspective. We have very good um, literature witness to this book, more so than many of the things that we absolutely say are historical and valid in the secular realm. So let's push that aside for today. And then let me say one other thing before I get started. There are those people, especially those who are listening, and maybe your friends or your family, somebody you know, and they have been told you ought to not ask questions about this book. That is the biggest lie on the face of the planet. I don't think God is going to fall off his throne if any one of us should ask a question. The real need is to put on a right mindset. And the right mindset may start completely upside down. Let me give you a perfect case in point. There are some names you've heard before, especially if you've gone online, you've been looking for Christian books, something to help you. A couple of names that will leap out at you. Um, Lee Strobel, who I met a few years back, very nice person who I believe uh, was greatly influenced by my late husband, but he was a writer for the Chicago Tribune who actually set out to disprove Christianity. That was his goal. And he ends up writing what is probably one of the best or better selling books for Christian apologetics, The Case for Christ and a whole series of those books, which then has flooded the market. There is another individual, Josh McDowell, who uh, was a college student, and his goal, very much like Lee Strobel, set out to disprove Christianity in a college paper, and was so overwhelmed by the evidence. And these are people who set out on a course basically to tear down and to blow Christianity away. There are many more of these. Of course, perhaps the most important convert, at least in my mind, because of the nature of this man's um, academic standing was C.S. Lewis, who maybe for the next generation might say C.S. who, but certainly I guarantee you have definitely read his books. 
um, because he was famous for, most people know him for his children's books, that when you begin to read, you begin to realize that there's a lot of symbolism that is no error. He started off in his childhood as in a Christian home, but fell away and became probably one of the most noted uh, atheists, and later on became what was labeled as the most reluctant convert um, back to Christianity. And there's a whole list of these. I could tell you about uh, a gentleman who is under the ministry of Ravi Zacharias, who um, is quite famous. He was born and raised as a Muslim. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a real different mindset when people begin to talk about somebody who just doesn't believe versus someone who comes out of a culture that says, if this is what you believe, you're an infidel. And it's not really the same, someone who just simply doesn't believe in this country versus someone who is of that faith, who comes to the faith in, of, in Christ. So there are a lot of those type of testimonies, but they did not come to those places by some emotional gut instinct. They did not come to those understandings of how they understand who Christ is simply by somebody telling them, you need to believe this, you need to accept this. These were hard heads. Even my late husband went through a period where he lost his faith and came back by a hard study of the resurrection and that produced an incredible message every year that he would preach on the proof of the resurrection. I think every single individual, even if you say, I don't really believe any of this, approach it like you would any other subject where you put on the thinking person's hat. Maybe it is the course to set out to say, well, I don't believe this and I'm, I'm going to set out to disprove. One of the most famous uh, people who I would say I have looked at as a source of someone who set out to disprove Frank Morrison, Who Moved the Stone? Has anybody heard of that book? Yes. Well, there's another one for you. I mean, the list is very long. And these are people who were thinking people. They weren't afraid to ask the questions. I'm asking you to do the same thing. Certainly for those people who think that simply because they believe it's impossible and there are many people who come to that. I just don't think it's possible. God could not have taken on flesh. I've heard people say, well, I can believe in some things, but I can't believe in others. I read an article by a Jewish scholar who actually believes in the resurrection, but he does not believe in the incarnation. There's all these fragments of thought. But if you're going to go into this book, you've got to go into it with one mindset, which is if you're going to look to dispel then put on the hat that says, I'm looking for the evidence, not feeling, not ideas. I'm looking for the evidence to disprove. Go that way. If you're going to go and say, you know, I'd really like to believe this thing, but I just, I have so many questions. Sit down and write your questions out. This is the best method I've found for studying subjects that I find rather taxing. Write your questions down and begin by crystallizing your thoughts. What is it that, what, ask yourself the question, what is it exactly that you have trouble wrapping your mind around? Because if it's not clear to you, you won't be able to pursue the truth of what you're trying to seek out if it's not even clear to you. Well, I just don't like the idea. Well, that's not going to work. Simply disliking something. You ever said that? I just don't like that, but you've never even opened your mind to it. So it's important to sit down and write out exactly what is this that I don't understand. Now, I know this sounds really simple for some of you to say, well, of course, because most of you sitting in front of me, you already have come to the faith. But I'm talking to you as people who, just like me, I love people who are not saved and do not really, they're not open to the gospel. And my goal, as I said, to be able to sit down and take some of these um, DVDs and say, hey, take a listen, or at least do me a favor and sit down for an hour and listen to one of these, 
It might give you an idea that you're not alone, and you're not alone. There are plenty of people just like you who they wrestle with this, and at, at the very back of the mind, there's got to be something that says, gosh, I'd sure like to believe that there's something else, that it, it doesn't just end with I die and I'm put in the ground or wherever you, whatever your choice is, and that's that. And what about living in the power, what the, the Bible talks about, living in the power of the resurrected Christ. That gives me the ability to overcome the circumstances of life. It doesn't mean that I will avoid them. It just gives me the strength to go through them. So let me start by saying we have to examine the record that is given to us. And again, my goal is not to set out to try and prove whether this is true. I'm acting today under the auspices, under the principle that this book is true. What I wish to make some valid points about, and I'm going to start with the Gospel of Mark, that hopefully in putting these down as hard points, some will be inspired to begin, at least it's a little less scary, to begin looking at the pieces that are being put out and maybe putting them together. Now let's talk about the New Testament. And, you know, as if you, like I said, some of you have already come to the faith. Don't, don't discount what I'm doing because it may help you in the very area that I myself am wrestling with when I hear about especially these folks I've mentioned. They're disinterested. They're, they're just not there yet. I've told you prayer is a wonderful thing. But let's do some explanation. So I'm, I'm starting, as I said, with Mark. It is the shortest of the gospel records that we have. And I'm actually going to start us off in the 16th chapter because that, remember, I said we are a community of the resurrected Christ. If you can cross the hurdle that Christ came out of the tomb, because the, the gospel story is the good news that God set out, God was in Christ setting out or setting on the stage the redemptive plan that Adam and Eve messed up in the garden, which is now accessible to us through Christ. And without the resurrection, I could talk to you about a whole bunch of other things, but that doesn't mean anything in terms to what I'm trying to accomplish here. So let me talk about Mark, which most scholars agree is the oldest between Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John in the writings that we're referring to. And most scholars agree, and I'm putting myself in that category, that Mark was writing as a kind of a secretary for Peter, the one who was with Christ. I'm not saying that Mark wasn't with Christ, but we kind of think that that is really a, a safe, uh, based on a lot of pieces of information in here. Um, we'll call him somewhat of a secretary. Now, are there things that are added in or, or glossed by Mark that make it um, flow a little bit? Yes, but Mark is, is very interesting. It's a lot, we'll call it a lot more choppy writing. And the note of interest here is in the 16th chapter, most of the oldest witnesses or documents that we have of this book end at the eighth verse. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this now, and then when I come to talk about the reliability, we'll come back to this. Most scholars agree that verses 9 through 20 of Mark's gospel have been added at a much later time, perhaps the second century. And I will explain that when I get to it. There are some interesting uh, things for us to look at. But let me start here because I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. And um, then I'm going to ask you a question, which will be rhetorical. But let me start in the 16th chapter, Mark's Gospel. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him, speaking of Christ. Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall, who 
shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be, be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. They went out quickly, fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now supposedly, and I said, and I'm of, of that camp that believes that Mark actually ends here in the eighth verse. And for all those that are kind of newer listeners, anything that's added in italics usually is added by the translators. So those words like they said nothing to any man, which is in italics, usually will be in the neutral. They said, they said nothing. In other words, no one, all right? Not just man. Here is the anomaly. A lot of people will ask, is it possible that there was another ending? And perhaps that, that ending that originally belonged to this was destroyed. It's possible. But I think there is another theory going on. Um, and I, when I say that there may have been a different ending, the reason why when you come to the ninth verse through the 20, you have a recap here. And not that any of this that is in the recap is, is bad or is an error per se just yet. If you read verse 9, now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, it's almost like we're, we're trying to explain or make it more clear. Some have said, well, why would, why would Mark end right there with the people, the women specifically, running out and they, were, they trembled and they were amazed and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Would you, if you were actually telling a story, trying to convince people, would you end right there? And the answer is no, of course not, unless, unless, if you think about it, and I've kind of put some thought to this, it's entirely possible. There may have been another ending, but it also may be that upon hearing this, the reaction of the one who is writing, which is Mark writing for Peter, the reaction is almost to drop everything and take off and join the band who's gone to sea. Now, it's like you have to put some thought into this and try and attack it. You're trying at times to maybe pierce holes into things to see, well, why is that like that? And why is that? God's not going to, as I said, fall off his throne if we ask questions. I think the most ignorant thing we can do sometimes is not ask because we're told we, we ought not to. But if you look at what happens from verse 9 on, we have a recap, which is, uh, Jesus Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene and a recap of, it says, of whom he had cast out seven devils. Not really sure that if we were talking about original, an original portion, would we have to recap that Mary Magdalene, if you're using the name Mary Magdalene, I highly doubt that you have to recap that Jesus cast seven devils out of her. There's, as I said, there's kind of some, some of these evidences. She went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Here's another reason why, and I'll, we'll talk about this also from Luke's perspective. But here's another reason why it is very highly plausible that this comes later, and that is because in that day, women were not adequate witnesses to anything. So, a later addition would almost make it mm, slightly more reliable. Luke will say the same thing. Matthew does not. And this is why I said, don't think because each one of these is saying something slightly different that we have to throw it all out because somebody says something different is recording different. In fact, it was Anderson, the great scholar Anderson, that said this. He was a trial lawyer. And I think Greenleaf, who wrote a book on a resurrection book on the same uh, subject said it is the evidence perhaps that gives credibility you know we we hear the term today collusion right 
that is to conspire to do something illegal or deceitfully. We would conspire collusion, right? There is no collusion because there is no absolute concrete repeating. If we all agree that we're all going to tell the same story and we're going to repeat the same thing, no one's going to deviate. Looks like we've practiced this thing. But you've always got to go to common denominators that are there. And it is from those common denominators, from each person's telling or recounting, that we have to glean. Not from what we think is, oh, well, that's different, therefore we cannot. It says, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them. So we have him appearing to Mary Magdalene and then to two of his disciples as they walked and went into the country. And then they went and told it unto the residue, neither believe they them, which is also kind of an addition on the women. So now two people that are not, two different groups of people, well, the, Mary and, of course, the two that were there, neither one is believed. And it says, afterwards he appeared unto the eleven. So unto Mary, unto the two, unto the eleven. And then we have the what is typically called the commission or the great commission in verse 15. And that's why I said it's not, we cannot say, well, Jesus wouldn't have said these things, and therefore, because he gives a commission, Matthew records it. He gives a different type of commission, and you've got to read in, in different places through other witnesses. So it's not as though we say, well, he never said go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now here is probably one of the most controversial sections of the writing because obviously these sections are attributed to Christ saying, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, they shall cast out devils. Well, did the disciples do that? or attempt to do that while Jesus sent them out to cast out devils? Right, so that's not, it's, it is not in contradiction with what has been said. And they shall speak with new tongues. Did that happen on the day of Pentecost? That's not in contradiction. They shall take up ser serpents. Well, I'm not sure that this part of, this is what is highly contested. Some people argue, well, Paul got bitten by one and he wasn't injured, therefore, I'm not, this is an area that people have highly debated, which produced, by the way, for those of us who have either been around or been exposed or read articles or seen crazy stuff of people who were Christian snake handlers. And if they drink anything, uh, dead, deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Well, um, I, I'm not going to say that that could have actually been attributed to Christ. These are the questionable portions where that's why we say this longer ending, most people, most scholars say it is not, and it is, does not appear in the oldest manuscripts that we have. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they, they shall recover. Did that happen in the book of Acts? Yes. So is this in contradiction? Um, except for maybe the taking up of serpents or drinking any deadly thing. And I would say don't attempt it at home. You're not a trained professional. <laughs> so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God. Here we have an immediate transition from Jesus' words to the ascension. And they went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Now, let's put a little stop right there. Remember, John said not all things was impossible, John said, to record everything that Jesus did. I happen to believe that. I don't think that every healing and every miracle, I don't think we have a record of. I think there were so many of them that what was recorded were the things that stood out for that time. But I think the, the record speaks for itself. But if we go back and simply begin to analyze what we do know as belonging to the original manuscript itself, there are some interesting things that we can begin to glean. So let's do that. So beginning with the, um, the question I asked, which we may return to at a different time, 
um, which is, did Mark intend to end right there with the women running out and being afraid and not saying anything to anybody? And by the way, the proof, if you end right there, that they didn't say anything to anybody is that we're here. They did. Does that make sense? It's very hard to tell somebody, especially women, don't say anything. <laughs> right? But the fact, the fact of the matter is there are certain things that are self-evident. You don't need to go, oh, I'm not sure about that. They ran out, they were afraid, and even if we had no other ending, we can know one thing. We're all here, which tells you something happened. Now, the one thing that we can peel out of this is it, it's very clear. It says here that um, when the angel speaks, and I think they're referring to it as a uh, young man, but we know that's an angel. And he says, crucified, he is risen. And he says, he that goeth before you into Galilee. So by implication alone, we have a couple of things Obvious, and then by implication. Obvious is the tomb is empty, except for the angel there. Implication is there was at least, at least one appearance to the disciples. Why? Because earlier he said he would meet them in Galilee. Now the angel is repeating that. So um, if we had no other reference to go from, there is at least that implication right there. Now, Mark's account of the empty tomb. And if we analyze, as I said, each of the Easter accounts, they all have slightly different, uh, but one thing that is unanimous along the way, and here's what's unanimous. If you take it from Mark's gospel, you have Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome in this record. If you go to Matthew, you only have Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And if you go to Luke, you've got Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them. John only has Mary Magdalene. And it's a very careful reading out of John because it references Mary Magdalene, but in John 20 and verse 2, it specifies that there are other women there. So there is one common denominator all the way through, Mary Magdalene. Women, woman, or Mary Magdalene. She is the common thread through and through. I don't care what, what order you want to put this is. There, there's something that is actually not so important about the number of women, but the gender that's there. And this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say it. Some don't like when I talk about this, but I'm just going to say it. And just The record speaks for itself. No first century writer trying to write down whether this be more of a biographical or this is the way it happened. No one in their right mind who's trying to write something to convince other people is going to talk about women being the first ones there. Now, the women were not an eyewitness to the resurrection. They were an eyewitness to the empty tomb. No human beheld that event that happened within the tomb except the angels, one or two, that were there. This is an important thing. God could have done a lot of things differently. He could have had many things happen, but the specific thing that's important, and let's talk about this. Uncomfortable for some people. The Catholic Church demonized Mary Magdalene and that was in the process of the study of Mary, the mother of Jesus, or we call Mariology, in elevating her to um, mother of God and deity to be venerated and worshipped within the Catholic Church. Mary Magdalene became demonized. It strictly says of her that demons or devils were cast out of her. It never paints her as a woman of ill repute and the confusion between Mary that anointed Jesus versus Mary, out of whom seven devils were cast out, and they may be one and the same. We will not ever know until we get over there. 
But I can tell you, I usually think that when the institution of the church paints something a certain way, go the other way. <laughs> You'll be much safer that way. So the first thing that is noteworthy is this is a woman who was full of the devil. Now I ask you a question because it's a real important one. Wouldn't it have made much more sense for God to have chosen the extreme doubter, Thomas, or the denier, Peter, to be the first goers and the first ones to be exposed, but yet God, in this record, and you can hate me, but it's, it is the book and not me saying this, God chose to reveal the first evidence of the empty tomb to women or to a woman. This is not sexist, this is not women's lib, this is just the facts here. And it is whether you take Mark's record that they ran out and they were afraid and they said nothing to no one, but yet we're all here, which tells you that, as I said, sometimes people can't keep quiet, or whether they went in and told as the longer version and Luke says where they went and told that this happened and yet it was seen as though they were speaking idle talk and the men had to go see for themselves. However you want to paint that, it really disturbs the modern church world today, and much of it, I'm not Catholic bashing, but much of it stems from, go back in church history, and as I said, I'm a historian that way, I will not say something that's strictly based on our modern times so that I can become socially acceptable. I don't ever think I'll be socially acceptable. What I'm concerned about is getting it straight and getting it right, and the thing that is straight and right is that way back there in the church, we begin to see an evolution that takes a course that begins to set a complete, a com complete priesthood that would become male-dominated, that was, by the way, never intended by God. Why? Because even Peter says, ye are a royal priesthood. Speaking of the body of believers, not the, uh, here are the clergy and here are the laity. You, you are a royal priesthood. Speaking of all believers, and those who would like to twist the Apostle Paul's words, he says there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free, male or female. He says all one in Christ. So when we begin to talk about this, it is important for me to set the record straight. When people talk about how God would not, well then you're not reading the same Bible as I am because God did choose this way. It's not my way. If it would have been Peter or Thomas, who cares? The fact is he, he came out of the tomb. He rose. But there is a point here that I must make because I hear ignorant people. And forgive me for saying that. I really I don't mean to sound condescending to the ones who know. It's to the ones who speak in ignorance. If God was so, and I'm going to use the B word, so bloody sexist, he would have chose to have one of the men go, and especially the worst failure. No, instead there's a message, go tell his disciples and Peter. Special, special message to the failure, just as much to the failure as to the woman out of whom demons were cast, that this is a message of grace and that God sees this new way in a different perspective. It is our warped, sorry, this is where I cannot stay silent. It's, it is our warped thinking based on hundreds of years of warped theology coming out of a warped institution that has pounded text out of context. And Paul says, let women keep silent in the church. If this woman had stayed quiet and had not said a word, I'm sure the disciples would have eventually gone and figured it out. They may have visited the tomb but this is the way God chose. And somehow, it's like everything else, the devil manages to creep in and plant seeds because socially of the day, women were not adequate witnesses. Now, God, who's in control of everything, you think he left out a detail when he said, yeah, I'll let the women go there first. Did God make a mistake? No. I don't think so either. But it took only about 100 to 150 years. Go back and look at church history, and you will see 
an incredible disappearing act. Study the lives of those who went out to preach the gospel. Begin in the book of Acts, and as I said this many times, there were women in the upper room, just as the witness shows here, Mary Magdalene, but there were other Marys there, other women there, and there were other women in the upper room. And the outpouring on the day of Pentecost was equipment for service to spread the gospel, not to spread gossip, not to teach how to knit and how to, how to do women's things or how can, how can men have their clubs. It was to go out and to spread the gospel. And if God was going to forbid a woman, there wouldn't have been any in the upper room. God would have said, these need to stay out of here while the men get equipped for service, the women can do whatever. Jesus himself did not have a problem with women supporting him. Luke makes sure to write this down real carefully. It was the women that supported him. Go check it out for yourself in Luke 8. It says of their substance, Lord of glory, who could have, he could pull money out of a fish's mouth, and yet it's the women who supported and it says they brought of their substance to support him. When all the disciples fled, save John. Who is at the crucifixion? Who is standing at the crucifixion other than John? Who is there? So please don't talk to me about who's stronger, who's weaker, or who's better, who's worse. God says, I love all of us, all of you failures. He includes men and women. When he says failures, he says it's plural, with no gender being specific here. So just as a little sidebar, when people talk about and they say, well, Paul said this, read it in context. And I said this on festival, and I'll say it here right now. If you are going to be that dogmatic about taking text out of context with women staying silent in the church, I suggest you also go back and get slavery reenacted because... Paul, who writes two-thirds of the New Testament, says, be kind, masters, be kind to your slaves. If you're going to be a legalist, man, do it all the way or shut up. <laughs> Sorry, but I just got to tell you, nothing irks me more. You know, in the Bible, God was very gracious. He made a donkey talk but it spoke out of its mouth. <laughs> Use your imagination, folks. Let's get back to the Bible. Now, I want to point something out. It says the women bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Somebody who's going to argue, who's been reading the Gospels, will say, wait, 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 wait a minute. John says, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came and already did that with 75 pounds of spices. What do you think the women were thinking? And I'll tell you what I think they were thinking. Whether somebody said, well, they didn't know that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus did this thing. Well, of course they did, because they're at... Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. That's where Jesus was buried. So don't say they didn't know. You ever love somebody so much that you just go overboard? Because that's what I think that was going on here with the women. They were so devoted to Christ. And I'm choosing to say that these women were indeed disciples of Christ. They were there along with the men. So devoted they maybe thought, more is more. And, of course, after a certain amount of time, of course, wouldn't the body start to stink? But it, they, they went with the intent that they might anoint him. Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, I said, oh, wait a minute, here's another one. Somebody said, well, John says it was dark. Well, how about this? They came after the Sabbath, which would have been at sundown, and sometime between sundown and sunup. Now, come Easter time, people say they get up and they go to sunrise service. And I completely agree with Dr. Scott. Don't waste your time. He came out of the tomb sometime after the Sabbath was over at sundown and sometime before the sun came up. The records are not confused. As I said, it's not collusion where we're going to get everything perfectly straight. I think the women set out at dark after the Sabbath, 
to go and it says they bought sweet spices, so they had to do it after the Sabbath. They set out for the tomb. And by the time all this happened, by the time they actually got there, it's probably already light outside. Sometime in that window, Christ came out of the tomb. Not only that, there's something interesting. They're on their way there and they're saying, who's going to roll the stone away for us? They went to the trouble to buy the spices. Now, see, I'm a woman and I can say stuff that is just, it's a statement of fact. A statement of fact is sometimes we do things without thinking, right? <laughs> like, well, that seemed like a good idea at the time. Let's go buy spices. And it's like, oh, crap. Who's going to roll away the stone? <laughs> One of the codexes says it would have taken up to 20 men to move the stone away. That's how heavy it was. And I can imagine them dragging the spices there and talking to themselves and saying, oh, they, this was really, this was genius. So who's going to move the stone away? Who are we gonna, which, which lunatic are we going to find to move the stone for us, right? But they didn't have to because when they got there, the stone was rolled away. And it says, for it was very great. So I like the fact that God takes care for these details. It really, can I just be colloquial? It would have really sucked if they went there with the spices and they had to stand there for a couple hours going, wow, what are we going to do? <laughs> Got any ideas? <laughs> no. All right. So didn't matter. The stone was there, by the way. They're, they've arrived at their destination, and the stone is there for a multiplicity of reasons. We could use the rational thing, which is, oh, the stones were used to keep animals out or to keep strangers out. But really, we know that the stone was put there to ensure that Jesus would not, there wouldn't be any funny stuff. You know, while they said perhaps, you know, the disciples stole the body, there were all these rumors already being spread. The stone was put there for a purpose. And when they entered, they saw a young man, angel, sitting on the right side. Now, this is the question I'm going to ask you. If you're, if you're trying to convince people, do you, do you tell people, yeah, and I walked in there, and there was some, some guy sitting over there. He was an angel sitting over there, and he talked to me. Are you going to write this down and actually think people are going to believe this stuff? Or it happened the way it did. And it seems to me the whole record is replete of God sending angels to talk to people. Isn't that what, isn't that the way it happened in the first place, right? God sent an angel and said, you'll be with child. Okay, whatever you say. But it's kind of interesting. As you keep reading, he says unto them, be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. And in the Greek, you have no separation. Which was crucified, he is risen. And this is very important because he doesn't say he was crucified and is not here. He says, crucified, risen. And even the grammar, which I won't get into right now, the grammar speaks of something called divine passive. And some people say, well, does that really exist? Well, it's definitely something that says Christ did not do it of his own. Remember, Peter, in preaching the book of Acts, says this, this that God raised up, this Jesus Christ, whom God raised up, divine passive, an act that was done by God, is not here. And behold the place where they laid him. Okay, of all the resurrection messages you've heard, one of those theories and probably thousands of messages, the women went to the wrong tomb. Well, all you've got to do is read in the ch chapter right before, in verse 47, 15 chapter, verse, verse 47, it says, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. Does that sound like people not knowing where the tomb is? But there have been abundant theories. And the fact that some have made this a possibility. In fact, I'll tell you how crazy that whole theory is. Because of, in the record where it says of Joseph of Arimathea, where it was a new tomb where no one had been laid yet, it's not as, as though for us, for example, where you go to a cemetery and you've got to find right numbers and columns in places. These were like, okay, this particular tomb that was freshly carved or that was new, 
people would know these things. It's, it's not like today where you've got, um, you've got to have a map. This, this would be their identifier. This is a brand new tomb. This is an important person's tomb, Joseph of Arimathea, to which it belonged. So they knew where the tomb was. They weren't in the wrong place. And here's the message. Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you. And this is what I want to talk about just a little bit when he says that he goeth before you. Now there'll be a record that says to Jerusalem here, it says Galilee. And I love the fact that this Galilee is the place that all of the people that were with him knew and were familiar with. And I just want to kind of put something that's just a little footnote right there because as Jesus goes before them into Galilee, it's like saying he goes before us into the places that we are the most familiar with. Theirs was Galilee. They knew it well. And I also find it amazing that a guy who is an angel is saying, go to Galilee. He didn't say, go to star zone three and, you know, technical terms of somewhere where they didn't know. He said, go to Galilee. Even the communicator from God is saying, go to Galilee because that's where he's going to meet you. That's where he said he would meet you. And then we get down to this last part. And this is, this is the place that I want to focus on because our English version leaves something a little bit kind of crazy with our words. They went out quickly, fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said, said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Let's talk about these words for a minute, because I think the words will clear something up for us. Um, let's talk first about this, the, they trembled, because that's kind of a common word, tromos. Um, Let's look at the word, actually, the, the words tromos, trembled, amazed, and the word amazed in the Greek is ecstasis. We get our word ecstasy from it. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. And that word comes from phobia. Now, if we were looking at this through a different way of seeing things, we might understand that many times in Mark's writing specifically. So, in the place where um, Jesus calms a storm, which would be in the fourth chapter of Mark, you remember they're out there and the, uh, Jesus is asleep and they say, Master, don't you care that we perish? He arose, rebuked the wind, said unto the sea, Peace be still. He said unto them, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. There's the same type of phobia, phobo word. Because they didn't understand what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obeys him. The words being used here, and they're used repeatedly. If you have the time, I strongly suge suggest that you look up these Greek words. Or I may actually talk about them on festival if time run short here, um, but you have a really good idea that these words are more used for not understanding what's going on so much, not as much as trembling in fear because I'm, I'm afraid of what's just happened, but I don't understand what's happening. Like the disciples didn't understand how this man could speak and calm the sea. There are a few other instances, let me give them to you, where we can look at and see what um, this word specifically for ecstasis. Take a look in the same gospel record, second chapter, after he heals the man, the sick of palsy, when he says, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. That's in verse five. And the Pharisees sitting there, the scribes, they, they said, why is this man speaking blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And if you keep reading, in 2.12 it says, immediately he arose, that's the, the one that was the paralytic, arose, took up the bed, went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God. That's that same, same word, not really understanding what just happened. Not freaking out like, <gasps> like I'm running for my life now, I'm so afraid, but what just happened? 
This is what I want you to kind of catch a glimpse of. How about, again, turn to the fifth chapter. We'll do this 542. This is after the raising of Jairus' daughter. Straightway, the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with great astonishment. These are the same Greek words being used. They, they marveled. They couldn't understand it, but they marveled at it, like, whoa, did you see that? So when you get to the ending here, the way our English makes this sound is like crazy women. And you know, my, my imagination before looking at the Greek words is all you could see is a bunch of flowing robes that probably looked like ghosts, but they were the women with arms up going, ah, right? But I think they were running out of the tomb. Like what just happened here? Which tells you something, not one of these. And even if you take the record that they, out of Mark or Luke, that the men had to go and check because they didn't believe what was being said. They were all surprised by the empty tomb, even though he kept telling them, this is what's going to happen. There'll be no sign, save the sign of Jonah. The remarkable thing is, they came out of the tomb saying, what just happened? Now, to me, when I get to the end of this eighth verse, it begins to make sense to me that what we call the fear or to be afraid and even if you go back and take these words into the Septuagint, you'll find even the word where it says afraid in the Septuagint is sometimes used for awe and reverence. Like fear of the Lord that way. Not fear and trembling, but fear of the Lord. Like what just happened? In a good way. And what I'm saying to you is that should be the message when people start to pick this apart. The empty tomb, oh, the empty tomb says it all, but... Some of these things that we've translated say it even better. They are not just highly suggestive, emotional words, but they really spell out, I believe, why we have a shorter ending. You know, if I was writing all this down and I'm sitting on my little stone and I'm, I'm scribing away as Peter's talking, yep, 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 and all of a sudden I hear these women, ah, right? I'm going to drop what I'm doing. What is going on? And I could just almost hear it as like a, a, a loud, I don't know, a pandemonium of announcing what they had seen and whether they didn't believe it and they went to check it out or whether they took them at their word, however it went, the fact of the matter is we're here, which tells you very suggestively that the empty tomb was indeed empty. And when we get to passing through Matthew, Luke, and John, and taking apart each thread that people have had trouble, they've stumbled over, sometimes for linguistic reasons, other times just because how, that's impossible. This Jesus, whom ye crucified, yet God raised him up. Now, if I was writing a story to try and make people believe, and I was in some type of delusional state to try and convince people and just follow along with me. Come on, just, just buy into this thing with me. I certainly wouldn't finish the story this way. I certainly wouldn't finish it even with a longer ending added. I wouldn't finish it that way. It would be one of those things that would be neatly wrapped up and every end is accounted for if I'm making it up. And maybe I'd include something that would be more of a benediction to the rest of the people who are going to follow this thing. That's why I said there's great credibility to have it end right here. But the reason why I'm, I chose Mark today and tried to pick it a little bit apart in the time that we have is to say the wonder when you begin to look at this, it is not only the miraculous, because Christianity begins with a miracle, but it's the miraculous thing of how God indeed did this and not... You know, we, if we were going to make this, as I said, the most plausible story, the men would have gotten there. It would have been any of the men. Here are the women, and I believe the ending ends right here, and the rest of the story takes up for Mark and Peter on the day of Pentecost when Peter stands up, when they say, these men are not drunken as you suppose. But rather, this is that which was foretold of the prophet Joel 
and begins to preach a glorious sermon. On that day, the church, there are a great multitude birthed into the church. All of that wouldn't have happened without this event. And the, how the church came into to being so great and expanding as it did, if it was based on a couple of loony women, delusional or whatever you want to call them, or even a couple of delusional followers, makes no sense. But investigating this little bit by little bit, you come to some conclusion of something. The writers were writing an honest report of what they saw. And as the chronicle unfolds, you realize no mortal could have put this together. And who, actually, who would believe this if Mark, who's writing for Peter, who is an eyewitness, and Matthew, who's an eyewitness, and John will write from a different perspective, which we'll talk about, and Luke, who supposedly sets out to put all things in order. We'll talk about that too. All these have to be looked at in their proper perspective. What were they trying to communicate to each one of us as I don't think they were intending to write a book that we now have as a book of the record of this event, which is at the front and the core and the center of our faith, the risen Christ. If, everything, if, if we start there and that's true, it makes everything else very easy to begin to start taking in and saying, okay, well, if that's true, let me start looking at these other things because they become easier and easier once you cross that hurdle of the tomb was empty, and no, he wasn't placed in the wrong place. He wasn't put on a pile to be eaten by dogs somewhere, but he came out of that tomb, and the appearances later chronicled by the Apostle Paul, who say he appeared to above 500 brethren at one time, tell me something pretty remarkable. He appeared to Paul and taught him and tutored him privately. Tell me something. And this, this was not part of the original bunch. Christ indeed came out of the tomb. These are the important parts for us to focus on. I suggest anyone who's interested, focus there first. Figure out that there's something really great that happened here. And the risen Christ, when he says he's not here, he's gone into Galilee, Christ will meet you where your Galilee is. That is in the everyday place. It doesn't mean in the church. It doesn't mean in the pew. It means right where you live and right where you are. And that is when we talk about Easter that is the message that should be front and center for the church. He is risen. More to follow next week, folks. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch Listen and learn 24 hours a day. Simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.